A few years ago, I came out with a video about my favorite Super Mario 3 ROM hacks, and not long after I released that video, a new ROM hack called Super Mario 3 Mix was released. A hack so massive and game changing that after it came out, I got lots of comments about how Super Mario 3 Mix was so much better. Man, I agree. And we'll get into that in a moment, but if I redid that video, it might actually be number one, overtaking my previous choice, Mario Adventure. Problem is, it wasn't out when I released that video. And to be honest, it's such a major ROM hack that it deserves its own video. So let's get into it. Super Mario 3 Mix is a major overhaul hack of the original Super Mario 3, created by a guy who goes by Captain Southbird. Southbird created Super Mario 3 Mix using his 2011 disassembly of the game, which in non-programmer terms means he broke the ROM down to its most basic programming language, assembly, and then he figured out what everything is and what everything does. Assembly is what the game was originally written in by Nintendo, so by breaking it down that far, Southbird was able to change the game and phenomenal ways, which would otherwise be impossible to do some of the stuff he was able to do here in Super Mario 3 Mix. To be honest, it's some of the most mind-blowing things I've ever seen on the original Nintendo. Super Mario 3 Mix was inspired by my previous number one choice for top Super Mario 3 hacks, Mario Adventure. It pays homage to many of the classic Mario games while still trying to keep the feel of the original Super Mario 3. There's a lot of new stuff here, but some of the big additions are new levels, music, characters, enemies, bosses, star coins, and new power-ups. Yeah, new power-ups. These new powers include the carrot from Super Mario Land 2, the boomerang suit from 3D Land, and the penguin suit from New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Every world from this game has its own theme that references other Mario games. There's just so much to this hack that I want to take you through each world to show you what's up with them. So let's start with World 1. The first world begins with an average start, being a remake of the first couple levels from the original Super Mario Bros. It's nothing we haven't seen in hacks before, but not long after the first few levels, we're introduced to some of the new aspects of the game, taking us through some of the subjectively best areas from the original Super Mario, with additional challenges thrown in all over the place. It's not always recognizable, but that's not a bad thing. Have you ever played some of the hacks that are meant to completely replicate a level, block for block? BORING! Mario 3 Mix bases the first world just loosely enough around the first Mario to be recognizable, but you'll end up playing it differently than the real Mario 1. This is also the first world where we first see the ghost houses in the game. Man, these graphics are really similar to that of Super Mario World and it's really impressive overall. The special stage in this world is with the Cheap Cheeps. Perhaps a bit too easy, but it's a good idea for a mini battle. The boss here in World 1 is Bowser, and the battle is pretty similar to those of the original Super Mario. After making it through this world, you'll rescue the princess and move on to World 2. The second world is based on Super Mario 2, and is where we start to see some of the major reworkings of the Mario 3 engine. Starting off in the first level is an impressive remake of the first level in Mario 2. I was genuinely impressed with the ability to jump and ride on the Shy Guys, but even more so when I learned you could actually pick them up and throw them around in the same general fashion as Mario 2. The mini battle in this world is with Shy Guys. Not all that difficult, but I did die the first time I fought these guys. Sometimes when things are too easy, you underestimate it and end up screwing it up. <laughs> there are a respectable amount of bad guys from Mario 2 that you'd expect to see here. This world has Shy Guy, Ninji, Spark, and Babam, with Birdo and Mouser as sub-bosses and an excellent battle with Wart as the end boss for this world. In my opinion, this battle with Wart is actually kind of more fun than the one in Mario 2. He is a lot easier to beat here though, with only three hits to take him out, and with that it doesn't actually last very long. Still really cool nonetheless. The third world is Boo's Woods, a world of death and despair. It's a dark world overall, though loosely based on the ghost elements from Super Mario Land 2, as well as Luigi's Mansion. There are some really great level designs in this world, with lots of great challenges and fun platforming. The mini battle in this world is all about jumping on these flying dry bones. The sub boss in this world is Big Boo. With the introduction of the penguin suit, you're supposed to use it to take out Big Boo. This part of the game didn't quite work correctly for me, as every time I tried to freeze one of the dry bones, the whole game would lock up. 
I'm running this in Nestopia, my preferred Windows NES emulator, but I just opened the ROM in another emulator to beat this part. I know this game had some pretty bad glitches in the past, but it's been updated at least a couple times since release, and it's pretty stable for the most part. Even later in the game I was able to freeze enemies, but it was only at this part that I had any trouble with the game freezing like this. The boss for World 3 is Bowser Jr. And it was a pretty fun battle. He shoots bullet bills at you and you've got to jump on them to get on top and jump on Bowser Jr's head. <laughs> world 4 is the Super Mario World. World. And yes, it has Yoshi. And yes, it's everything you ever wanted from it. Yoshi looks amazing and controls just how you'd expect him to. There are some really creative levels in this world and the castles introduce the fence climbing segments from Super Mario World. The sub boss in this world are the rhinos from Super Mario World. This part ran really slowly for me though. So it was pretty easy to beat. The mini battle in this world is with the green Rexes. Poor Rex. Is he even a bad guy? He doesn't even ever try to hurt Mario. He's just walking along. <laughs> Anyways, you've got to stay on Yoshi here and beat a single wave of Rexes to get the power up. The boss on this world is Bowser Jr. again. It was kind of glitchy and took me a few tries to get past him. That being said, it was a good battle and timing your jumps while watching out for the fire and the turtle shells is actually kind of tricky. Unfortunately, we have to leave Yoshi behind at this point and only briefly see him later in the game. I miss you, buddy. World 5 is a desert world with desert elements from Super Mario 2, Super Mario 3, and the Super Mario Land games from Gay Boy. G G game Boy. Game Boy. Game Boy. This world is pretty short, but I'm not a huge fan of the desert levels we've seen in so many official Mario games, so I'm okay with that. This world has a lot of those really fun digging segments from Super Mario 2, along with the new addition of pouring quicksand, which will fill up the room you're in quickly when it's triggered. This world's special battle stage is with Gao, the sphinx-like lion enemy from Super Mario Land. Here you'll fight four of them at the same time, which can be pretty tricky when they're all shooting at you at once. The sub-boss here is King Totomesu, which in my opinion is a lot easier to beat here than in Super Mario Land. Three jumps on his head and he's gone. The main boss for this world is a big black single-headed triclide under the control of Bowser Jr. At least I think he's a triclide, he also kind of reminds me of a big cobra. He'll shoot green stink balls at you and dart underground and try to spring up underneath you. It's not a very difficult battle here. World 6 is a Super Mario Sunshine world. I was never a big fan of Sunshine, probably because I never had a GameCube until recently and only played a tiny bit of Sunshine. Regardless, I'm sure some of this world will look familiar to you. This world has the crabs from the original Mario Bros arcade, along with these tosser guys called uh, Tossermen. Tossermen. <laughs> This world has stages with those weird Lego style blocks like in Super Mario Land 2 for Game Boy. It's super cool to see something insignificant yet strange like that brought back to a Mario game. The special battle stage in this world is with these crabs from the original Mario Bros arcade. The level is laid out in a similar fashion and it's a lot of fun. The sub boss in this world is Petey Piranha who jumps and floats around. Not a terribly difficult enemy to take out when you get the pattern down. The main boss here is Bowser Jr. again, this time flying around in his junior clown car. This battle can actually be a pretty good challenge as the main platforms to get at Bowser Jr. are pretty low and can be pretty tough to avoid the turtle shell that Bowser Jr. throws at you. You can't exactly just stay on the platforms either because you have to watch out for the fire that he throws down at you. After you hit him with the turtle shell, he'll disappear and drop lit bombs down at you. My game was kind of glitched out though and Bowser Jr. was a bit suicidal. He ended up killing himself for me. Uh oh. <laughs> World 7 is a Super Mario Galaxy level, which has the whole gravity aspect of Galaxy. This is probably the most challenging in my opinion, as the changing gravity at times will throw you off. Here we find some of the elements from the giant land world from Super Mario 3. The sub boss in this world is one of the UFOs from Galaxy. This guy is not really difficult to take out, you just need to jump on his head to stun the ship, then kick it over to the electric post to zap it. 
He'll spit out those little UFO ships from Kirby, so watch out for them. Once again the main boss is Bowser Jr. And this time he's controlling a ship that can both shoot fast moving fireballs and also control gravity. Not a particularly difficult battle, but when gravity does switch it can get a bit disorienting. Especially when you're trying to dodge the fast moving fireballs while upside down. After defeating Bowser Jr. on the Galaxy World, Rosalina shows up and tells you that they've taken the princess to the center of the universe and to the final world 8 we go. World 8, the final world, is a mix-up of all the other world themes we've seen in the game. This world has a pretty straightforward level map, with each level corresponding to the theme of each world, such as level 1 being Super Mario Bros, level 2 being Mario 2, 3 being Booze Woods, and so on. These levels are probably the most challenging ones in the game, but if you've gotten this far, you should have built up enough skill to tackle these ones. In this world, we take on King Koopa in a battle similar to the end of Super Mario 3. What's different here is that you've got to get him to break the bricks and get him to fall in the lava three times to take him out. At first I thought maybe I could take him out with fireballs, but that didn't work out so well. <laughs> what ended up happening was strange. Another glitch where it looked like his neck was broken and he would always jump off center on the bricks. So he couldn't fall in the lava, making it impossible to beat him. Skip the fireballs and just take him out with the lava. The game ends with the princess being saved and peace being restored to the Mushroom Kingdom and the galaxy once again, while we watch the credits and a fly through of the theme worlds. There are a couple other worlds in this game that I'll only briefly mention, as I haven't really explored them in too much depth. These are sort of extra bonus worlds that you don't really need to visit. First there's World Zero, which was described by Southbird as a throwback to his childhood days, when he would experiment with Game Genie and make corrupted, invalid worlds. He'd also draw levels on paper, and this was a way to finally bring them to life. I can definitely relate to this. The next is World 9, the Star Road world, which is pretty much just a hub to get around the map. You can get to this world by hitting start and selecting Star Road while on the map. Graphically, this game looks incredible for something on the NES. I believe the sprites were ripped and converted and touched up from their original games, and some seem to even be created especially for this game. Really impressive artwork overall, but I think the graphics in the ghost houses were the most impressive to me, as they're really not too far off from the 16-bit Super Mario world. The sound effects are all, for the most part, exactly as they were from Super Mario 3, which in my opinion really helped this game in terms of staying with the overall feel of Super Mario 3. The music, however, is very impressive with the way they were converted from other Super Mario games into this game. Some of them sound really, really great, but the ones that just had altered notes from the original Super Mario 3 game sound kinda screwy, and I didn't really like them much. But that aside, man, wow. It seems in most all aspects, this hack is aiming to impress, and definitely succeeds in my opinion. Some of my favorite things about this game are the save feature, which in my opinion Mario 3 should have had the save feature to begin with. It's a big game and it kinda sucks having to go through the whole thing every time you want to play. I played the first world of Super Mario 3 too many times. 3Mix fixes this with an excellent save feature that allows you to save your game at pretty much any time. It comes in handy because with the massive size of this game, it's huge and I can't imagine having to start fresh with every play. There's a ton of collectibles and unlockables too, and it really wouldn't have made sense not to have a save feature. Another thing I really like is, again, the unlockables and collectibles. This game has so much stuff to unlock, such as an alternate end boss, which I still have yet to see. Unlike in Mario 3, you're allowed to re-enter stages and play them again to find the collectibles. Even after you beat the game, there are special comets in the game where you have to go back through the levels and collect them. I haven't done this yet, so I'm not sure what actually happens when you do get them all, but if you have, I'd love to hear about it, so definitely leave me a comment below. Another awesome thing about this game is the difficulty, or lack of the extreme. Most Mario hacks, in my opinion, are too hard to play without save states. 3Mix does an excellent job with the difficulty, keeping it around the same level as the official Mario games. Not too easy, but just enough that you're not going to get bored with it. And to be fair, some of my least favorite things about this game are the story, 
or lack thereof. The original Mario 3 had you trying to retrieve stolen magic wands to transform kings back to their original selves. This game really doesn't explain much, and what it does explain, it barely even follows a plot. It isn't until later in the game that you feel that there's actually a reason why you're running around through these levels. Another thing I sorta of disliked about this game were some of the level designs. Not all of them, but some of them. A lot of parts are not in the same design aspect of official Mario games, where Nintendo made most of the levels pretty simple and straightforward, most of which you could easily speedrun. In 3 Mix, the levels feel a bit more involved, and at times you need to be more conscious of where you're going, and what obstacles or bad guys are coming up next. I found myself not just running through each level as fast as I could, but I had to put more thought into it. This might sound like a good thing to most people, and indeed it might be. But in my own opinion, Mario games should be more casual. I don't think a little kid or noob could get nearly as far in this game as they could with an official Mario game. But it was probably meant for us older people who grew up with these games. To wrap this up, I know this game is probably old news to many people by now, but I deliberately waited to put out my thoughts about it, as there were some big glitches in the game and it kind of frustrated me. But those are all gone now for the most part, which I figured, and the game can really be enjoyed now. It's an unbelievable hack that really raised the bar in terms of ROM hacking, and I really don't see anything topping this in terms of Super Mario 3 hacks, at least for a while. If you're a fan of Mario games, more specifically the old school ones, you're gonna want to play this game. It's incredibly enjoyable and I definitely recommend it. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like on it. And if you wanna, check out some of my other videos. I've got another series called Classic Mac Games where I review some old Mac games from the 80s and 90s in a similar style and try to keep them interesting. Some stuff you've probably never seen. If you're not really into that, then please let me know what you want to see. I've got a list of about a million things that I think would be awesome to make videos about, but it ultimately comes down to you guys and what you're into. Let me know. Now I gotta get out of here. So bye! bye.